Welcome to the Core Walking Podcast, a step in the right direction. I'm Alex Mavalon. And I'm Jonathan Fitzgordon. And today we're going to talk about surgery, <laughs> its potential complications, whether it's necessary or not, and certainly the subject of rehabbing and prehabbing. Hey, Jonathan, what's up? Uh, not much, Alex. Having a good day. How about yourself? Uh, pretty good. It's cold here in New York, but... Yeah, it's cold in Cleveland. Winter has arrived. <laughs> well, it's interesting to start talking about the cold because the cold always reminds me of the little aches and pains that I have, which may or may not be the result of surgeries that I've endured. And today we're going to talk about surgery, which I'm very excited to hear everything you have to say about. I guess what I want to start out with is you've had three knee surgeries, as you've mentioned on previous podcasts. And I just want to have you describe them in a little bit more detail because it's a lot of surgeries for just two knees. So can you share with us what happened exactly? Yeah, sure. It was um, three surgeries in one year and seven months, over the course of one year and seven months. That's extremely intense. In my early 30s, I started doing Ashtanga yoga. My structure is that I am very, very open in my hips, way too loose, you know, can turn my feet out completely, uh, born to do ballet. And I thank my parents for not sending me to ballet because I think I would have really been destroyed. So I have these very loose joints. I get to yoga, not weak, but not, I didn't have any core. I just had really strong legs. And I was rollerblading before I did Ashtanga. I was rollerblading some long distances. So I wasn't weak and I had this ability to hyperextend my knees, which means I take my knee past its natural range of motion and hyperextending your knees is really bad. I got to yoga, I started doing this advanced yoga and they actually told me to do it more in certain cases. I did yoga for about two years, really advanced Ashtanga yoga. My knees started hurting, complained about it to my teacher. He said, oh, you'll get over it. It's a rite of passage. He didn't really have anything to say to me about my alignment or anything like that. And then one day I was actually playing softball. I turned to my right to stop a ground ball, which I did successfully, I might add. And then when I got up to throw from third to first, my body turned left, but my foot and ankle didn't go with it. It was a pivot injury, right? My foot planted and my knee turned. There was just an explosion inside of my knee. I hit the deck. It hurt. I actually finished playing the game. So I left the baseball game. I knew something was wrong. I actually didn't bike home. I took my bike on the train. So that was my first injury. You, Went were, to the, you were in pain doing that, going down. I was in terrible pain. I mean, the knee was swollen and stiff. It was, it was a mess. I went to an orthopedist. Uh, so the first surgery was supposed to be a meniscus clean out. The doctor said, I'll You'll be on your feet in 10 days. And I went under the knife and came out and he handed me a pair of crutches and said, you can't wait bare for six weeks. I was so confused. I was so anesthetized after that surgery that I didn't even realize what he told me. And in the morning, he was like, it was a way more major surgery. Like he mumbled under his breath in our meeting. Oh, it's an easy surgery. You'll be on your feet in 10 days. 10% <clears throat> of the people don't go so well. And... When I called him the next day and I got him on the phone, he was like, yeah, you know, you're one of those 10% that I mentioned. So he said that the surgery was way more serious than he had anticipated. Because most times they go in and they just kind of shave the meniscus and set you back into your life. And in this case, the entire meniscus had been pulled off of the bone and he put it back on. He reattached the meniscus, which was just a much more intense surgery and required me not to bear weight and be on crutches for six weeks. And... I did the physical therapy, I did what they told me, and I took it really seriously. I learned nothing from it because I got back on the yoga mat after about four months or five months after the first surgery. Six months later, I was back in the doctor's office. My other knee popped. I got that second surgery, and you know, it's such an intense thing when you go to the orthopedist. It's, it's just a factory, right? There are these 10 rooms, you sit in a room, he walks in the door, he spends five minutes with you, he shakes your leg around, and he goes, all right, we're going to take an x-ray and then it's either surgery or physical therapy or nothing. I have helped people not have that surgery, right? So in retrospect, I no longer take surgery so lightly. I no longer think I would have had the second and third surgery, though I believe that first surgery was unavoidable. I don't regret my surgeries at all at the same time because finally after the third surgery and me being an idiot and going through physical therapy twice and not learning anything, Someone said to me, what are you doing to prevent the fourth surgery? You know, that was the, 
the moment where I said, oh my God, I'm not doing anything. Like I just spent a year and seven months of my life and I'm ready to just do it again. Because if I go back to doing yoga the same way that I've been doing it for the last two and a half years, why in the world wouldn't it happen again? It was, it was incredible to me. So that's where all of this began for me, all of the pain relief work and all of the walking stuff. It began with examining my own posture and realizing, man, I don't know how to walk. I walk terribly. I stand terribly. And in, to be honest, when I started teaching myself how to walk, I was walking really badly. And I went to see somebody, this woman, Sandy Jamrog, who was a mentor to me and my wife and an amazing woman. And she basically at one point was trying to tell me what to do. And I couldn't hear her. And she said, just stick your butt out. And that was really the beginning of the work I do, right? Figuring out what's the proper replacement for the pelvis. So post those three knee surgeries, no regrets. Probably wouldn't have had the second or third one if I had to do it again. But I have a much, much, much different view of surgery 15 years later than I did when I was a wee young man of 35. So can you share with us what that view of surgery is? I don't have it. And that doesn't mean that some people don't need surgeries. My sister was born with a congenital hip problem. Her hip was turned out. Uh, my grandmother noticed it at six months old. They went to the local GP in Brooklyn and he had no idea what to do and he wasn't a hip specialist. So they just like, they set her leg the way they wanted it to point and they put her in a cast and they actually put her in a series of three casts over a year. So her hip was just trash, uh, not helped by being immobilized for a year. So at 57, she had a hip replacement surgery that served her really well. She needed that surgery. You can still see that her hip is a mess, but she's pain-free. And I told her to have that surgery. But then there are other people, like I said, when it comes to like the knees and meniscus, who I have helped to not have surgeries. The hip replacement is an incredibly good and successful surgery. So it's a surgery that I'm much more likely to recommend to somebody. Uh, but the truth is that if you have hip pain and you go to an orthopedist, they might tell you to have surgery and you don't necessarily need that surgery. Or you could delay that surgery for a long time. And it's not to say that some orthopedists wouldn't tell you to delay it for a long time, but people should never forget that, you know, a surgeon's job is to do surgery. So why did your sister wait that long to have the surgery? Because between six months and 57 years old, that's, that's a lot of time. I don't really know why she waited because she was in so much pain. But you know, when you're, I'm 55 and I can't imagine replacing a body part. I think there's a mental, emotional process to not wanting to give up or do that. And um, I'm going to ask her, you know. I wanted to kind of shift back to knee surgery a little bit because personally, and so selfishly, I want to talk about myself, but personally, I've had knee surgery to repair a torn meniscus and an ACL that was torn completely clean. So there was no more ligament there, basically. And obviously, the recovery was lengthy, unpleasant. It took me a full year to get back to the activities I was practicing prior to the injuries, such as tennis and basketball. Which Wait, what, what did the doctors tell you? Did they tell you it was going to take a year? Yeah, they told me the recovery was long. I could be running, you know, in four to five months. But the basketball and the tennis is a lot of torque and it's a lot of impact. So that was going to be longer. It's just you have to make the ligaments strong again. The ligaments are not vascularized, as of course you know. So they just take a longer time to heal. I don't regret the surgery at all because without it, I wouldn't have been able to go back to any of the sports. And now I can play them somewhat but not 100%, you know, and it turns out now that I have arthritis in my knee because the doctor told me I have bone on bone friction, uh, which is a very common expression these days, like it's just rampant everywhere. And I'm just curious as to what you think about this bone on bone business that everybody talks about all the time. I mean, bone on bone as a diagnosis is real. When you're told that you have bone on bone, it means you have worn away the cartilage and literally there's no cushion. Cartilage is a cushion, but it's connective tissue and it's cushion uh, synovial fluid between bones, right? So you've worn away that cushion. And we do that for a number of different reasons. You do that for postural reasons. If you hyperextend your knees, you're going to be putting more pressure on the medial, which is the inner cartilage, than the lateral, right? Think about it. You can even stand up if you want and, and just jam your knees back. They roll in and back, right? When knees hyperextend, everything in the body rolls. You know, there's not a lot of straight action. So 
the knees, when you when you lock them back, they kind of roll out and you're you're squishing into that meniscus and over time you're going to erode it and damage it. And, and I recently wrote a blog post called Bone on Bone is Nonsense. That was, uh, that was what I wanted to talk to you about, actually. I wrote that because of a conversation I had with my brother. So I guess this is a familial episode where I'm going to talk about my sister's hip surgery, my surgeries, and now let's get to my brother. His diagnosis was what led me to write that blog post. And I do not come from a skinny family. I just carry this spare tire and I could easily lose 25 pounds, right? And I'm, I am 55 years old. I'm in really decent shape. I hike extensively. I ice skate fairly regularly. I walk endlessly. Like I feel like I'm in good shape. I'm just I'm a big fat guy. So my brother is overweight. Getting back to my family and our knees and joints, we're all too loose in the hips. We're all open hips. My father was too open in the hips. My mother too open in the hips. So we are. And my brother goes to the doctor and he gets this diagnosis that his knees are bone on bone. And he's telling me this. And I said, so what did the doctor say? And he goes, well, he said, I'm going to need knee replacement surgery. And I said, when? And he goes, well, I said, I'm not interested. And I said, well, that was a smart thing. But then I said, what, what else did he say about the bone on bone? Did he say anything about why your knees are bone on bone? Did he say anything about your posture and the hyperextension of your knees? And he said, no. Did he say maybe that carrying an extra 50 pounds, to be fair, of weight is not good for your joints? He said, no. I said, did he say anything about your core strength and your ability to withstand a knee replacement surgery, which is a profound surgery that is not nearly as good as a hip surgery? To which he answered, no. To which I said, you cannot in a million years have a knee replacement surgery. And the thing is that I can have that conversation with my brother. I have worked with plenty of people who went ahead and had knee replacement surgeries after not being asked those questions by their doctors and not really being given the, the honest scoop about what it entails to get a joint replaced and what kind of rehab and recovery it entails. Now, the flip side of that is I am working with someone currently, she's in my membership program, and I don't know how old she is. I'm going to say she's 70. She'll listen to this and let me know, I am sure. Uh, she has recovered from a knee replacement in the most profound way. I think it's been a year, but she is at full activity. As an aside, because you know I'm so interested in sleep, she just spent post knee, re re knee replacement two months camping in the woods, sleeping on the floor every night, right? So that you're not doing, you're not camping and hiking and doing that without using your knees. So she did knee replacement and she's working with like five different people in addition to me. You know, she has the resources. She just has the, the smarts. She recovered beautifully from a knee replacement. If my brother was to have a knee replacement surgery, he would not recover. That said, he's in a lot of pain. You know, his, his body is really broken. He was just visiting us for a, the weekend and to see him walk, it's unbelievable to me. And it's, it's a I'm product so of so being like, too loose in the joints. It's unbelievable. Well, he's my brother. And, you know, to watch him walk out of the car and take 10 steps and really be in pain is really profound to see. And then there's guilt because this is what I do for a living and I'm not hooking him up. So we had a 15 minute conversation about that. You know, surgery is just way more intense than people think it is or people are told it is. I'm working with a woman now who is 43 and she has three children and she had three C-sections in seven years. And I swear to you, no one ever told her just how intense one C-section is. That C-sections are profound and invasive surgery where they basically open you up, split you open to remove your baby. She had that done three times in seven years. And no one really said how powerful that was going to impact her life. And then add to that a really interesting thing. When the surgery is over, you are not cared for. You are given some, a little being to care for. Right. So instead of being able to recover from this surgery, you're sewed back up and said, here's your baby. Take care of her. It's so profound. And then I meet this woman, you know, eight years later, something completely unrelated to the C-section. But really look at her and say, you need to for I, I was going to say forgive, but there's nothing to forgive. But you need to give yourself a break in terms of what you're dealing with in your body and realize that you went through these three profound surgeries that I think 
on a certain level is not a great choice for the medical profession to make. And I can't speak to her particular need to have C-sections, but I can speak to my own, you know, personal arrogance and annoyance about the surgery, right? And like C-sections are often done for convenience and for doctor's convenience and because they don't want women to go through labor fully or it's five o'clock on a Friday and they want to get out for the weekend, you know? So C-sections, just like knee replacements, just like, I mean, ankle replacement is a whole other story to talk about, but surgeries are often not respected for their intensity. People don't take a deep, enough of a deep breath before they say, yes, I'm going to do that. They have bunions. A bunion is a bump on the outside of your foot where the bone just moves out to the side and you can have a surgery for that bunion. And that surgery, that bunion surgery does not have a very good success rate. Carpal tunnel surgery, which is pain in the wrist, pain in the first three fingers of the hand, the thumb and the first two fingers. The surgery for that is they, they just cut open a sheath of connective tissue in your wrist. And you know what? For, I don't know, maybe 25 to 50% of the people it works. And then there are plenty of people where it just does not work, right? So when you're suggested to have surgery, you better know your, the success rate of the surgery you're looking into. And I'm not kidding when I say that the hip replacement is a great surgery, but let's bring the last part of my family into that, which would be my mother. So my mother has two surgical failures in her history, right? The first one was 18 years ago at this point, maybe even longer, before I ever started teaching yoga or learning about this stuff or had my own knee problems, she had debilitating back pain that she didn't deal with. She finally went to the doctor and they said, we're going to do a spinal fusion on L5S1, which is a classic surgery. Um, another surgery I don't love particularly. Uh, she went into that surgery walking and she's now bedridden. She's been bedridden for seven years and she's bedridden as a direct result of that surgery because they clearly nicked the nerve and she lost all the muscles on her outer leg. They just atrophied, but she never lost the pain. She, that surgery ended. She was in extreme pain the day after the surgery. She was in extreme pain for a long time. The pain went away, but the muscles on her outer legs never returned. They atrophied completely. And it was a progression to being bedridden. It started with uh, walking with a terrible limp that they call Trendelenburg gait. It's actually not a limp. It's a hiking of the pelvis with every step you take. Mm -hmm. And then she started using sticks, you know, those walking sticks that are like crutches, but they're handheld. She went from that to a walker. She went from the walker to electric scooter. She went from the electric scooter to bed and hasn't been out of bed in a very long time. That was her uh, spinal fusion, right? Which is a very successful surgery in terms of success rate. Her second surgical failure was a failure of anesthesia. My mother was 79 when she went for the, a hip replacement because she was in so much pain, even though she was in a wheelchair and a scooter, uh, that replacement worked in terms of getting her out of hip pain. So she lays in bed and she's not in excruciating pain. There's a positive to that. But I don't think she recovered from the anesthesia. And I remember walking into the rehab post-surgery and it was just an extraordinarily thing to see her slack jaw. She was gone. She was like a ghost of herself. And she recovered to a degree. She got her, her wits back about her, but never the same way. So she ended up in bed with just much less facility uh, mentally. And I think those, that's a result of two surgical failures over 20 years, a woman who was vibrant, smart, active. So that has profoundly colored my take on surgery. Yeah, my father actually had a pretty massive heart surgery uh, in his late 40s and, you know, had to go under for a long, long time. And uh, he lost part of his hearing as a result. Every, you know, look, everything I'm talking about is anecdotal, right? So I'm not talking about a science study. I'm talking about my family. But Google anesthesia and geriatrics. And you will read um, article after article of people post 65 not recovering from anesthesia because it's about sensitivity and it's about the brain. Does that mean that the 585 year olds who are on operating tables right now around the country aren't gonna recover? No, does not mean that everyone over 65 is gonna suffer from general anesthesia. But do you wanna be that 
Do you want your parent to be that person who goes into a surgery and doesn't come back? So there are just so many factors to consider. So this is a, a kind of weird story about anesthesia in terms of my knees. So I got my first knee surgery and I really felt that I came out of that surgery really confused and not clear headed. So I didn't even know what they told me when they handed me the crutches. And I was bummed about that. And I really wanted to recover and I really wanted to get back to yoga and the anesthesia messed me up in a, in a way, you know, for a few days. So the second surgery I had, I said to the guy, I said, I'm really, I want as little anesthesia as possible. And he's like, what are you talking about? And I said, I didn't like how much I got the last time. He goes, all right, all right, all right. And they knocked me out and it wasn't as bad. And I felt like I recovered better. I felt like I recovered sooner and faster. Like the third surgery, they're prepping me for surgery. And I say to the anesthesiologist, I want, and I'm really serious about this. I want as little anesthesia as possible. I do not want to feel it, right? I want to recover. And he goes, all right, but it's not going to be fun. So I did not feel the surgery at all, but I heard it. And I, well, I shouldn't say I didn't feel it. I didn't feel any pain but I felt what they were doing to my leg. And I heard how the shearing and the ripping and the tearing, and it is intense. So I realized, oh, that's why they want to put you out as much so you don't feel it, but you don't experience it. But at post that third surgery, I healed. That was a 10 day healing. I was in London 10 days or 11 days after that surgery, walking miles. And you credit that to having avoided general anesthesia. I don't credit it to that, but I think it definitely helped me have my wits about me and heal better. Don't forget, it was a year and four months of physical therapy and rehab. I had my act together. I was ready for it. Hey, we're just taking a moment here to chime in about our sponsor. And this may come as a surprise, but it's Core Walking. Alex, did you ever think about the way you walked before you discovered Core Walking? Not too much, no. And why do you think that is? I don't know, but I get the feeling you're about to tell me. That's right. A question I have for all of my clients and customers is who taught you how to walk? And the answer is no one. Somewhere around one year old, you stand up, creep around holding on to furniture, and then you take your first couple of steps to cheers from your parents if they happen to notice. And after that, you are left to your own devices. And that doesn't always add up well. While walking might not be what caused you to be in pain, poor walking patterns can keep you in an endless cycle of injury, physical therapy, and even sometimes surgery. It doesn't have to be this way. If you learn how to walk using better patterns, you can have more energy, get better sleep, and most importantly, get back to the lifestyle you thought was lost forever. For more information, go to corewalking.com now and get 10% off your first purchase using the coupon code POD10. That's corewalking.com, coupon code POD10, P-O-D, one zero. It's interesting talking about anesthesia like that because I injured my wrist about a year and a half ago and I had to tone down all my sports, including my yoga practice. Uh, it turns out yet again, the ligaments in my wrist had torn clean. So the bones were, had moved apart from each other because it's like a rope, right? And then the rope wasn't holding the bones together. Wait, did, did, was, there a, was there a literal accident that led to that? Or is that uh, over time? Your not that I remember. There was no like like harsh trauma. I think it was just years of abusing it, you know, and doing handstands and whatever. You know, I do a lot of sports, and I don't necessarily have a great form in some of those sports. And I think it was just wear and tear. You know, how many surgeries have you had all together? Uh, just my knee and my wrist. Okay. And so, and those were both ligament surgeries. And I've, you know, I've dislocated my elbow, but that's not a surgery. You know, they put that back in, but that's the same elbow as the wrist surgery I had. So that might have had something to do with it as well, you know? Wait, so you hurt your elbow first. Yeah. And then 10 years and later, I tore my wrist. Yeah. There's no question. How could that not be connected? Yeah. I'm sure they're connected. At the um, reset of the elbow, put a certain amount of pressure on the wrist that holds on the ligament until finally it gave. And you don't regret the wrist surgery at all. I don't regret the wrist surgery. And, but it was interesting because the anesthesiologist anesthetized my, you know, from the shoulder down to the fingers completely. So my arm was like just a limp noodle, but they didn't put me out. They gave me kind of a sedative. So I didn't actually hear the surgery, but I kind of woke up and I wasn't, you know, in a haze, like after right. surgery, which was 
much more intense and I was like super out of it for four or five days. Uh, not to mention I was taking a lot of painkillers. But I kind of want, want to talk about the wrist surgery a little bit more because I went to a yoga class when the wrist was already hurt and this yoga teacher told me, oh, your the body has this tremendous capability for healing itself and if you do nothing and you just let it heal and do the right, you know, right nutrition and the right exercises, your wrist will heal. And I'm like, no, it won't because it's a torn ligament. Because you can't, <laughs> ligaments don't just grow back. You need surgery. They need to reattach it. And certainly I could have lived without the surgery, but I would have been in a lot of pain. I clearly I lost a lot of range of motion in my wrist. Again, I don't regret it at all because now I'm back to almost full range of motion uh, seven months into the recovery. And my wrist is much stronger than it was beforehand, certainly. And the pain is totally gone. But I am curious as to what you would say to that yoga teacher, because you were talking about avoiding surgery whenever possible. In this case, I don't believe that I could have avoided it, but I want to know what your take on that is. Well, I think the lesson you learned from that is don't listen to your yoga teacher. That's correct. Um, and I'm a yoga teacher. And I think don't listen to yoga teachers because we don't know what we're talking about. I'm glad that it took this long into the podcast for you to tell me you don't know what you're talking about. There you go. And I don't know what I'm talking about. I just have a lot of opinions and I want people to hear my opinions and decide if they agree with them or not. I mean, but you do have some experience in treating people uh, who walk out of your walking program and are not magically healed, but have done the work in order to heal themselves and presumably avoid some possible surgery down the line. There is no question about it, but I do want to be, and I'm not trying to make fun of myself or mitigate my skills, but what I do is really simple. Even though I do know a lot of the science behind what I'm talking about, I'm backing up with, I know a lot about the body and the mind and blah, blah, blah. What I do to help people heal is very, very simple, right? I'm really telling people to make the smallest changes to their body, but I'm also just making fun of myself. I don't agree with her. Maybe I can meet her and she could tell me why I should agree with her. And I'd be very open to agree if she had a good uh, basis for saying, well, I do know these people who've had ligaments reattached. And if I knew anyone who had a, a separated ligament that had regenerated or reattached, then I would have something to call upon. And I have none. Ligament's job is to connect bone to bone. So if a ligament detaches from the bone, it is failing to do its job, and there is no possible way for that reconnection to actually happen. Now, you might go to a Chinese medicine doctor who will give you the right herbs to help your ligament regenerate and reconnect. I really don't think that is possible. That said, if I got into a car accident yesterday and blew, tomorrow and yesterday and, and you know tomorrow and blew out my ACL, I wouldn't tell them not to do the surgery. Um, the point of my saying here is not at all to say don't have surgery. It's the point of all of my work, which is be as aware of, as you can about your own body and healing process so that you're the master of your own destiny. And that's to me the only way you can age well. When they reattached the ligament to the bone, do you know if they did a graft? Do you know what they did? How did they do it? You know, the d ligament was torn. It didn't detach from the bone. It was torn in the middle. So they kind of brought the bones back together and sewed the ligament up. And so they tightened up the ligament. Yeah. And there's all these... You know, it it's still loose. You feel that it is still loose? No, I can see it on the x-rays when I go for my checkups, you know. But you can see the bones in my right wrist are much closer together than the bones in my left wrist. That said, before the, before the repair, the bones in my left wrist were just... It was, looked like a garage, you know? <laughs> like you could drive yeah. a car into it. I wonder if they tightened up other ligaments around it. Like that, he did exactly that. That's actually he did exactly right. that. in my in my hand, actually. So it's so wild, right? I have a friend who was a um, born to be a football player. Started playing when he was five, uh, six foot four, like one of the most amazing athletes I've ever met. Right. So he was born to play pro football. Went to college, at Georgia State, I believe. He had the tightest tips in the world, and he was so tucked under, like his shoulder was just born to get blown out. First season blew out his shoulder. And what they did, he goes, I got to play football. So they tightened the ligaments in his shoulder so he could still block in a certain way. So then the next season, he blows out his shoulder again. They tighten the ligaments even more, which limits the range of motion of his arms, yeah. but allows him to keep playing. And the third season blows it out yet again. And they're like, you're never playing football again. And as a result, as an adult, he can't get his arms over his head. It's unbelievable. Right. Uh, but so that's a story of three surgeries he completely, absolutely chose to have. They went one worse than the next, and no one ever told him to change the way he stands.
No one ever told him that the way he walked might be affecting the tension and torque on his shoulders. So what's the point of having shoulder surgeries if you don't make changes in other parts of your body? So kind of in that vein, earlier you were talking about preparing for surgery. And so I want to talk to you about what you think about the concept of prehabbing. And by that, I mean, you know, preparing the muscles and the fascia related to the area where the surgery is to occur in order to make a recovery that's swifter and less arduous. Uh, it seems like it's a concept that's growing in popularity and certainly physical therapists, chiropractors, rolfers, all other so-called alternative health practitioners. And now I would say even some doctors are heralding it more and more. Even the doctors are usually like, you should get the surgery as soon as possible. It doesn't give much time for prehabbing. What's your take on prehab? I mean, I think people are kind of insane if you don't prepare for a surgery. And when I mean prepare... Muscles that get cut, muscles that get messed with, they are affected, they atrophy. When you take two weeks off, let's say 10 days for a meniscus clean out, like I took six weeks off, your muscles get messed with. Why not make them bigger beforehand to be able to bear the stress that's coming afterwards? So that just makes total sense to me. And it's insane not to, but I actually think there are different reasons for surgery, right? Like if you're a basketball player, you you come down wrong on a rebound and you blow out your Achilles tendon. Uh, you could rupture the Achilles completely and you need to get it surgically repaired. That person needs to have that surgery, but that person needs to also think, why did it rupture? Now, maybe it just ruptured because one time you landed wrong, but I think it ruptured because you walk wrong, you run wrong, you jump wrong, you land wrong. So prehab has to include how you move, how you exercise, how you stand. And in addition to that, if you're doing your knee, you should be on an exercise bike 30 minutes a day, every day. And if you're a professional athlete, right, you are working out like crazy to get ready for that surgery. And if, again, I keep referring to like car accidents, you get into a car accident, you might need that surgery immediately. What are you going to do? It's just, this is what it is. But in general, if you are a 50 year old person who is overweight and has not done a lot of exercise in their life and is not particularly strong and you show up and the doctor says you need hip replacement surgery, it's almost impossible for me to imagine that it's the need for it is immediate because it's just worn out over times. And if you're in pain, deal with your pain for a few more months while you get your body ready, right? Like if you've never done any exercise before and you have a knee surgery, you should go to an hour of Pilates every single day for three months. Why, you recommend, why would you recommend Pilates for... Well, I love Pilates. Core. Everyone needs core, right? right? When we move, you're supposed to move from your core. You're supposed to move from your center. But so many joints and extremities, they break down. They break down because we don't move from the center. And like in the shoulder, you know, you're a tennis player who's a professional tennis player who they're obsessed with Pilates, right? They're just these core, they're these exercise maniacs. When they hit a tennis ball, they are hitting it from their abdomen. And that stroke comes from the abdomen to the, ra the racket tip. But when you don't have core and you don't have technique and you don't have teachers, it's very likely that you're hitting from the shoulder to the fingertip, right? From the shoulder to the end of the racket, that you're not really involving your core. I'm laughing because that's exactly, I just learned to hit from my core, basically. I've been playing tennis for almost 40 years. It's beautiful. I mean, I just ask people, you come in and they say you play competitive tennis. And I said, if you if they didn't have shoulder injuries, I knew where they were coming from. And they're coming from a good place, right? Tennis is hard, man. Tennis is hard on the ankles and it's hard on the shoulders. Tennis is a fierce game, right? But people who love it just love it. So that's what I mean about Pilates, right? When we build the center to move from the center, you're going to benefit from it. And then if you're if it's knee surgery, I would be doing uh, inner thigh exercises and I'd be on the exercise bike and I'd be doing calf strengthening and you know for shoulder it's different because sometimes the shoulder is not mobile but you figure out ways to strengthen the rotator cuff in anticipation of rotator cuff surgery i completely believe in prehabbing i wish i'd been more aware of it when i got my first surgery for my knee um, when i got my recent wrist surgery i did a lot of work beforehand so that i could rehab much quicker and my rehab went very very fast comparatively to other people who were in physical therapy with me so you really i do believe in prehabbing as well as rehabbing regularly and not going just twice a week when you're in PT. Um, but I want to talk more a little bit about... Uh, let me interrupt you and say that 
you should start your rehab the minute surgery ends. Like if it's a knee surgery, you should be engaging your quad the minute surgery, you know, as soon as you can in the, in the most gentle way possible, but you got to get, you got to move. I believe that. And I certainly did not do that. I was off my leg for five or six weeks. Do you have any surgeries that you're really anti, that you really don't like, that you really recommend against? Because uh, everything you've said so far is explore all your options, but maybe surgery is your only option or your best option, given what your life situation is. Are there any that you really dislike that you would adamantly advise somebody against? Yes. Uh, but before yeah. I get to that surgery, just to touch on one that I kind of dislike, you know, whatever, is bunion surgery, which I mentioned earlier, right? Uh, there are people who have bunion surgeries for cosmetic reasons when they don't have pain just because they don't like the way their toes look. And I don't think anyone should ever have that surgery for any reason ever. If pain is not part of the equation, don't have the surgery. That's when they, uh, cut, they cut a piece of the bone out, basically. for bunion. Yeah, I mean, people do crazy things. There are women who have the fifth toe removed, the bone of the fifth toe removed, right? So you yeah. can wear pointier shoes. But the surgery I really don't think anyone should ever get is labral surgery in the hip. And I say that only, again, anecdotally, because of how many people I have worked with who regret that surgery, who actually think the surgery made them worse. So again, it is, I am, it's anecdotal. I don't have a scientific study to point to. But the way the, the hip works is that there's a ball at the top of the femur bone, and it sits into the acetabulum, which is the socket. And that acetabulum, that socket, is ringed by this piece of connective tissue called the labrum. And it kind of sucks the femur head into its socket. So right? is, it, so that, is the labrum like cartilage or is it? Fun? Yeah, it's yeah. cartilage. It's connected. Everything's connected tissue, right? Like everything is connected. And then it's a matter of like the tension or the, the density of that tissue. So, so that's like a another, suction cup kind of. It, 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 well, it's thin and it's a ring, but yeah. it kind of like holds the thing in. And it's so interestingly different in the hip and the shoulder because the hip is a very solid joint. The shoulder is a very loose joint. Yeah. So they never did these labral surgeries, I don't think, until like 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when two baseball players had them. And I guess they liked them. But athlete, you know, professional athlete is a superhero. They're like so much more finely tuned than we are and so much stronger. And they have millions of dollars for rehab and cryogenic chambers to be in and ice baths. And they're capable of these things. So then people started getting these labral surgeries and i know that in the beginning it was a really bad surgery because they just removed the labrum itself that went really south then there was like a wait uh, wait, wait sorry you, they removed it and didn't replace it with anything that's right they just would remove the labrum yes. then there was there was a spur a bone spur in the acetabulum that they would remove but it turns out that that spur is necessary right so they've stopped removing that spur and now the surgery has gotten better and now it's just a, it's a clean out right where they just try to clean up the labrum but i still come across people who have had this surgery and it makes them worse my mother's spinal fusion made her worse but that's because the surgery failed but these label surgeries are considered successes they're told yeah go on you're good and they're not good and they're actually worse and i just repeat myself endlessly it's part of my job while I'm not saying don't have surgery, I'm saying be as aware as you possibly can about the surgery you choose to have. So what is, why, why do people get labral surgery? Is it that the labrum is torn or is it just that they have hip pain? Why, where does the pain originate? They, the they get pain that uh, they go to an orthopedist for and the orthopedist tells them you need a labral surgery. Well, because their MRI can show a frayed labrum, right? Oh, I see, okay. But then I, my question is, do you have an MRI from five years ago as a baseline? Because that same labral tear could have been four years ago when there was no pain and you could be suffering psoas pain. And I use psoas all the time, but you're talking the same area of the body and misdiagnosed psoas pain, which is going on all the time. It's a lot of the people that come to work with me privately, they have this pain that every doctor has told them to do something, maybe not surgery, but often surgery, but they're always being misdiagnosed because it's about this mystery pain that's in the groin, right? So you go in with groin pain, and if you're not thinking, you know, somewhat esoterically about psoas work and psoas release work, you say, oh, you have a labral problem. It's in the same area, like there's a, um, a wrapping pain that I completely connect to the psoas and inguinal ligament that I think is often diagnosed as labral pain. 
And don't forget, you go to a doctor. Doctors don't say, I don't know. You know, I was in Italy um, doing this retreat and we were having a great time and someone said, you know, I, I have to say, I think your strength as a teacher is that you say, I don't know. And I said, that's because I don't know. And I'm really happy to say when I do. Like, I'm re you know me. I'm really happy to say when I know. I have a lot of opinions. I do. But know. doctors are not trained to say, I don't know. And trust me, yoga teachers aren't either. For the most part, you go to an orthopedist, they're not looking to tell you, go to a yoga teacher and do yoga therapy. That's not their job. Their job is to say, I think you have this and my scalpel can help you. Right. And it very often does. I think a lot of people are maybe looking for a quick fix as well, which ultimately that is a quick fix, right? You're out of pain. You get a rehab for a year or whatever it is, but you're out of pain and your ligament is fixed or whatever it is, you know? I wish it could be so simple because the truth is how long before all the different compensations that build up come to haunt you on the other side of your body or your ankle. And um, because you don't change the way you stand and walk, why are you not going to end up in a similar place uh, somewhere down the line? Well, that's your main beef with surgery is just that compensation. But then, so lastly, and perhaps most importantly. Well, no, my main beef with surgery is that human beings resist change at all costs and do not have a surgery if you're not willing to change the rest of the way your body works and moves. So you just mentioned this a little bit, but I guess as a last word and perhaps maybe the most important word of this episode, do you think that changing your walk and your standing posture and your sitting posture can help you avoid surgery? It can actually absolutely help you avoid certain surgeries mm -hmm. and it can help you support every surgery. If you are, are, have a certain injury or something, I can't say necessarily that if you change the way you stand and walk, uh, that pain is going to go away and you won't need that surgery, right? It could though. Foot stuff, someone can tell you to get foot, you need foot surgery on your big toe because your big toe is a mess. And I can literally say, well, you don't align your hip in its socket and that realignment can take care of that big toe. And the doctor would be like, oh my God. Right. And that's a thing I help people with all the time. Like people have foot pain and don't think how it connects to the pelvis. So on a certain level, yes, you could change, you can change the way you walk and stand. And that's how I help people avoid meniscus surgeries. One of my many wraps is building a better body is a science project. You come to me with knee pain and you come to me with a, a diagnosis that you need meniscus surgery. And I say, give me three months to see if you do need that surgery. I'm going to look at the compartment of the leg. I'm going to test their inner thigh, their outer thigh, their hamstring, their quad, their calves, and bring all those muscles into balance and make them as absolutely strong as I possibly can with block between the thighs, you know, wall sits, calf raises, squats, blah, you know, all the same stuff I use all the time. It's pretty simple stuff. And then if I can build those muscles well enough in a balanced way, not in the way that this person has been building them for 35, 40, 50, 60 years, because the way they've been building them through their walking and their exercise is why they're in the surgeon's office to begin with. So if I can rebuild the leg, and that is a science project, and it takes a long time. But I mean, I, I actually think three months is a reasonable amount of time to show somebody they don't need that surgery. And I'm honest, right? Like I meet people with rotator cuff problems. They go, oh, you, you, you might need surgery. You might be served by tightening up those ligaments a little bit. It's all relative, but it always comes back to the same thing. And then if you have a surgery, let's go to the rotator cuff. If you have a shoulder surgery and you had that surgery for different reasons, because it could have been a fall or an accident, but it could have just been repetitive stress. But it often happens because the position of your pelvis does not support the position of your shoulder girdle and arms so you have that surgery and don't address the position of your pelvis why are you not going to break down in some other way if you address the position of your pelvis even though you've had the surgery that addressing your posture and your walk and your movement patterns is going to support you going forward into the future you know you a seminar it's not a seminar your workshop is called it's all about the psoas but really it should be called it's all about the pelvis because the pelvis comes up again and again and again and, uh, no, there's no question. I and they're, they're, I agree with you, but I think you need to change your trademark. <laughs> I, you know, I am happy to because I do say both all the time. And you, you, go, you can't have a harmony in one without the other. That's the thing. 
as always, it's been an education. And thank you again for sharing all your knowledge with us. This was really interesting. Like I said, I've recently I've had, you know, a couple of relatively major surgeries to repair injuries that I believe could have been avoided by better form, better posture, and certainly better walking. It's very interesting to me to what you have to say about it, especially since you've been through some similar surgeries and kind of rehabbed yourself by learning to walk again. I learn from uh, my students all the time. And if you have anything to say about anything I've said, I'd love to hear it. And if you have any questions, we really welcome questions and we welcome comments. I would say that we covered a whole lot about surgery here, but a lot of people out there might have come up against surgeries they've had that they're curious about that I would be very happy to answer questions about. So feel free to uh, reach out with questions and comments. And as always, we ask you to share this podcast with one person that's saying that you like what you've listened to. And also, if you can do us a favor and go to iTunes and put in a rating and a review, that would help us just so much. Reviews and ratings are like the lifeblood of the podcast. And we want to bring these to you for a long time to come. I look forward to the next one. Alex, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Same here. Yes, feedback and reviews are always very, very welcome, especially feedback. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. And we'll see you very soon for another one. Have a great day. You too.